Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Once again, we have the privilege of coming into the house of the Lord. And I'm reminded of the promise of the Lord to his disciples when he said, Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And in another place, he told the apostles that he's given them the keys to the kingdom. And, and yet it seems like so many don't have interest in the things that God gives. They're more interested in the world and the things of the world. And those things that the world has to offer are only uh, temporary. But the things that the Lord gives are lasting. Uh, I ask that you pray for me for what time I stand before you this morning. That God would uh, give me direction. I feel pretty empty this morning. So uh, I, I need... I need the Lord to uh, help me to bring a message that would be a benefit to you, that would be honoring to His name, uh, have a desire to build you up and encourage you. Uh, and it's hard to do sometimes when you're discouraged yourself. <laughs> uh, it seems like that's my path is one of almost continual discouragement when dealing with uh, the people of God, not necessarily just here, but all over. When when I uh, uh, have relationships, I guess, or I'm friends with pe different people on Facebook, and I know a lot of different old Baptists, <clears throat> and uh, sometimes I'm discouraged because there seems to be a lack of conviction. Uh, I can't convict you of anything, but I know the Lord can. As we were talking about praying for uh, praying for your family, for your son and his daughter, and I, that made me think immediately back to the time that when I was under conviction and Betty was not. And I certainly thought she should see things my way. Uh, but that's not how it works. So the long short of it is we're to pray and we're to love and accept one another unconditionally for who we are. For by the grace of God, we are who we are. And he's the potter and we're the clay. And you know, what I would want you to be or my wife to be or, or anyone else is not who the Lord wants you to be. And that's that's a message that's often lost on couples, young couples especially, when they, they get married and they come and have the idea that it's their duty to change their spouse. And, and it may be very well that, that one spouse would have such an influence over the other that they're change may come about, but the change that needs to come about is that which the Lord uh, the Lord works in a relationship. Otherwise, uh, it won't last. I'm thinking a lot about, uh, there's a lot of fear mongering going on in the world right now. Uh, a lot of the things that you see on television, it's just fear, fear, fear. Uh, that's not God's message. That is not the message. Now, there is a fear um, that we, each and every one of us, need to have instilled within us. Uh, actually, Solomon summed up all of his writings in the book of uh, 
Ecclesiastes, to fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. We are to have a fear of God. And that means a, rever a reverence and a respect. Uh, unlike the fear of the world, the fear of the world has torment. Uh, the devil wants to torment. We know that scripture that says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil's coming down having great wrath. For he knows that he has but a short time. And I've often wondered about this, and I don't want to digress too far from what I want to talk about, but he has to know something about the timing because he has let his, his plan just trickle out a little at a time. Uh, I'll use this illustration again and I'm going to this time I want to ask the young people uh, in the congregation who knows what tree food Tom is do you know what tree food Tom is anybody Saturday morning cartoon think about it again tree food Tom well I saw it yesterday for the first time and my, my granddaughter had requested it. And uh, it made me think back to the days when uh, when I was growing up, my parents wanted to sleep in on Saturday morning. So they would say, go turn the TV on and watch cartoons until we get up. And I remember Tom and Jerry and Felix the Cat and uh, the Flintstones and things of this nature. Uh, those were pretty mild. Those were pretty mild. But as the years progressed, and I stopped watching Saturday morning car cartoons, and every once in a while, uh, I guess I would let my children watch. Or, and I started studying TV instead of watching it. And, and I've noticed that how over the years uh, we've been desensitized. Uh, so I can see the transition between Tom and Jerry and Tree Fu Tom. Tree Fu Tom is nothing more than indoctrination into the occult and witchcraft and sorcery. I mean, spelling out. Does anybody know who Dora the Explorer is? Now, okay, you know how Dora, Dora the Explorer is an interactive cartoon where they st where she wants you to do something and she stops and gives you time to answer. Uh, and she she says great or whatever. Anyway, it's interactive. You're expected for you to for the children. And I watched my granddaughter. The reason I know about Dora the Explorer because my granddaughter loved it, and she wanted me to watch it with her. And I sit down and watch. Well, this this tree food Tom business is also interactive. Except what they're doing is showing you the moves and uh, of the uh, that uh, that's involved in all this sorcery and witchcraft. And I like to, my jaw dropped when I saw that. And this is all in the name of Saturday morning children's cartoons and entertainment. And what this is, is shows us that the enemy works by degrees. And over the years we've been desensitized. I remember a long time ago when we, we heard, probably back maybe in the early 60s, when we heard that someone had been murdered we were all shocked, dismayed. There were people who would cry and, and when they hear about these things. Now, we've been desensitized. We hear about it every day, all day long. It's like life has no value in the sight of some people. We've been desensitized. And that's how the enemy works. So it makes me think that he has some kind of understanding about a, the, the timing uh, of, of when God's going to judge all this. He says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil is coming down having great wrath, for he knows that he has but a short time. So our, our enemy is formidable. Uh, he is not to be taken lightly. And the scripture teaches us that we're not to be ignorant of his devices. And he has many devices. And that's why we need to learn to study the Word of God. And that's why we need to, to recognize... <clears throat> well, one of the things 
let me back up a little bit. One of the things that seems to discourage me is as I'm talking and sharing with people of God across, around the world, we talk about the world, and I'm pointing at, at certain things and saying, that's of the world, that's of the world, and that's of the world. And they come back and say, no, it's not, but because they engage in it and they do it. But they never can point me to where the world is. And I, and I believe that it's we all want to defend the things that we're engaged in and the things that we practice. We want to try to find a just justification for them. Uh, that's discouraging to me uh, when the people of God just blatantly refuse to believe that they're that they could be caught up in the world. Uh, but it's a reality. We're all born. Uh, into this world dead in trespasses and sins and we're by nature children of wrath even as others. And we have a propensity to follow the world and, and the things of the world and we have to unlearn all the things that we've been taught all of our lives that are contrary to the will of God. And once we unlearn them, when we need the grace of God to, to separate ourselves from them. Um, that's, that's just how it works. So, but anyway, there's a lot of fear mongering that's going on, and that's not God's message. He says in Isaiah chapter 40, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem to tell her that her warfare is accomplished. And that, it, that indeed is a message of comfort to know that Jesus Christ has finished the work that God gave him to do. He, he fought the war, he won the battle. He's risen victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And He's coming back some someday to get His people. Now, as we were singing that song that some of us are leaving and going one by one, it may be that we are the generation that will be alive when the Lord comes back. That's a great hope and expectation that I, I hope that every one of you have that instilled in your heart and, and you're looking and watching and waiting for the Lord to return. He may come in this in our lifetimes, He may not. But I think that we need to be anticipating and looking for Him. But His message is one of comfort, and the enemy's message is one of fear. And the Lord talks about fear, and He tells us who we should fear. Over in Luke chapter 12, this is where I'm turning this morning. I guess I'll read, start reading about verse 1. He says, In the meantime, when there, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another. And he began to say on his... Now, I've seen that. But you know where I've seen that before? I've seen that at Walmart. Right around the 24th of December, they, you've got wall-to-wall -wall people. They're, they're running over each other. But I want you to take the materialism out, out, of, the, uh, out of the equation and consider that the people were so desirous to, be, to, to talk to the Lord or to even see the Lord or hear Him speak that they trod one upon another. Uh, sort of like those... <laughs> Like I say, it makes me think of that, that countdown to when they're fixing to open Best Buy for the, the TV the, the TV set that's on for ninety nine ninety nine, and then they run over and kill each other trying to get to it. But but I think that this is a a cause that's that's uh, a little bit different. But he said they trod upon one another, and he began to say unto his, unto his disciples first of all. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be shown. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in the closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that they have no more they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him 
which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is for, forgotten before God. Now, Matthew says, this is not a contradiction. Matthew says, are not is not a sparrow sold for two farthings. Here it says, uh, five for two farthings. That's just not, it's like buy, buy three, get one free. That's what, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way, but that's not a contradiction what Matthew says about how much the, the, the sparrows were sold for it. Uh, you know, and it, I really don't know what the purpose of, the, of selling the sparrows was. I don't believe that they were used in any kind of sacrifice, but nonetheless they were, they were sold. Uh, but he says, Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for ye are more value than many sparrows. So, one of the things that we want to impress upon your mind this morning is that you have worth in the sight of God. And you're of much more value than many sparrows. Uh, the worth, uh, you're worth the Son of God giving His life for you. And I know that sometimes we talk about depravity, and the depravity of man is true, and when when the writer says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and says who can know it, uh, we think about depravity and, and the, the sinfulness of man and, and our unworthiness. And in a state of nature, indeed, we are, we are truly uh, unworthy. And in a regenerate state, we come to the knowledge through discipleship to know that Jesus Christ is our worthiness and Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Because of His shed blood, uh, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. But brothers and sisters, you are, you are worth something in the sight of God. And you are significant. Because if you were not significant, and if He did not love you, He would not have come to suffer the things that He did so that you can live in heaven in immortal glory someday. And that's a promise that He's made. He's given unto you eternal life. And, and, and you're in the Father's hand and no man is able to snatch you from the Father's hand. Uh, God is greater than all. He's greater than the enemy. This enemy that, uh, that, that is swarming all around us. Aren't you glad this morning that you have a place of refuge in Jesus Christ? He is your strength and he's, He is your place of, of refuge, city of refuge. He is your high tower. He is a hiding place. Now, and for a little while, uh, not just today, but every day that we can, we can run to Him and we can find safety and, and we can find uh, help in time of need when we call upon Him. Because all around us it seems like the world is crumbling and falling apart. Uh, God does not want you to latch on to the message of fear. Uh, and if you can't seem to get past that, then what you need to do is cut off the source uh, of, that, of, where, of that news. Uh, and that's the television. Uh, that's the radio. That's the internet. Wherever it's coming from, if it's causing you worry, if it's causing you concern, um, what does the Lord say in one place about men's heart failing them for fear, looking for those things that are coming on the earth? Uh, God does not want your heart to fail you for fear. He wants you to rest in His finished work. He wants you to have the comfort of the Holy Ghost. He wants you to know that He loves you, that He cares for you, that you belong to Him. You are His purchased possession. And that He has He had prayed for you in the garden when He said, Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil. Don't, don't buy into the message of fear. Uh, there's a saying, and, and I know that it seems like of late I've, I've uh, been speaking more about this than I normally do, but you've got some people that are, the, the messages that we're hearing 
on the television are controlled by about, there are about six different co corporations that own the 1,500 television stations or the channels. And uh, it, so all of this is owned by a few people that are working together and they're controlling the message that we're hearing. Uh, I'm not believing it. I'm not, I'm not buying it. Just because it comes across the TV set does not mean that it's true. Uh, I've come to a place in my life where I began to question everything that the world is saying and everything that the world is doing. And I want to look in this book and I want to find out what, what does this book have to say. Uh, but the Lord tells us not to fear those that can kill the body, but fear him that hath the power after he hath killed to cast into hell. That's whom we should fear. That's whom we should respect is fear God. Don't fear what man can do to you. And, and men can do some pretty awful things, uh, but we're not to fear that. We're, we're, we're to have trust. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths or direct your steps. I believe that. Uh, we're, to, we're to trust even though that there's, there's this picture being painted for us by the world, even so, our God is greater than any scenario that, that uh, the devil can dream up. He's greater than that. But he says, I'll forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath the power to cast into hell. I say unto you, fear him. It seems like nowadays you hear very little preaching about the reality that there's a hell. Uh, brothers and sisters, if there's not a hell, I would like to ask, what is it that God saved you from? What, what did He save you Did He save you from annihilation? From just being snuffed out and, and your soul just vanishing away after this life? No. He, he delivered. He said in more than one occasion, the Lord probably taught more about hell than He did heaven. He told those Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, He says, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Hell is a, is a reality. It's a real place. And none of us want to go there. I know. I certainly know that I don't. Um, but we have to have a good understanding of what it is that we've been safe from in order for us to appreciate the salvation that's been wrought through Christ. If you don't understand that you've been delivered from, a, uh, from living in a, um, existing in a burning hell for all eternity, how can you appreciate what, you, what you've been saved? How, the, how that the Lord saved you? How, can, how does that work? I, I don't know how that would work. Uh, but, but I know in the beginning of my experience, there was a time that I saw myself deserving hell and I saw myself spinning down into that place and, and, and uh, knew that my works were rotten before God and I had sinned against His just and holy laws and I deserved eternal banishment from His presence on account of what I had done. And I, I came to conclude, just as one of the songs that we sing, that if my soul were sent to hell, Thy righteous law... It proves it well. But I know that the Lord led me to the foot of the cross to, know, to see that He had delivered me uh, from hell. And that He had placed me in Christ Jesus uh, and because I was chosen in Christ before the world began. Just as each and every one of you were chosen in Christ before the world began. And at some point in time, God's going to touch you. It, it may be that, that He does it like He did with John the Baptist who was born of the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Or it may be like He did with the thief on the cross uh, who I believe was uh, regenerated there or, or, or converted there on His deathbed as He at one time was railing against the Lord uh, in, in concert with the other thief that was on the other side. And then something happened to that man and he changed. I don't know when that's going to be for some people. <clears throat> that's why we don't get in the business of judging people to say if they don't receive the message, 
of election or predestination that we don't judge them to say that they're not children of God. Uh, because we don't know when God is going to regenerate someone. Uh, the, the people that we've been talking to that are resistant to the message may very well be elect, uh, but they're just not yet regenerate. So Paul says, When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace <laughs> to make His Son known in me. And so when it pleases God, He does it. So we don't get in the business of judging to say, well, you're not a child of God because you're not receiving the message. Um, because you've not embraced Christ. Because you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't know when someone's going to be born again. That's what he says in John chapter 3, verse 8. And you all should know that verse very well. So, we're told who we are to fear. And we're to fear the Lord. And we're to reverence Him. We recognize the fact that this God that we serve is exceeding great. And our little, or my little pea brain, I'm not going to call you pea brains. I can imply it though. We've all got little pea brains. He says, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. That's what Paul had concluded in one place. This God that we serve is great. And now we said we see through a glass darkly. But then, meaning on, on, the, on the morning of the resurrection, we're going to see Him face to face and we'll know even as we're known. And we'll, I believe that we'll have a perfect knowledge and a perfect understanding. And I believe that we'll be whole body, soul, and spirit. And our bodies are going to be raised from the grave and be fashioned like unto His glorious body. Now, that brings me to a question. Here's a rabbit. Let me just go ahead and chase it. Uh, you know, there's a scripture that talks about if your right, right arm's offend you, cut it off. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. For it's better for you to enter into life uh, without an eye or without an arm than into hellfire having both eyes and both arms. That, I don't believe, is talking about immortal glory. It can't be. Because I believe that people that were uh, in this life that will be resurrected, that were maimed, uh, uh, if they're going to be fashioned like under the glorious body of Christ, and you're going to have both eyes, you're going to have both arms, you're going to have, have all your members... You're going to have all your members and you're going to be fashioned like the glorious body of Christ. So I think that we need to find another application for that particular text. And I think it has more to do with church discipline than it does uh, heaven and immortal glory. But in John, 1 John chapter 4, I want to pick up believe, uh, reading about... Uh, I guess verse 1 would be a good place to start. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, for many false prophets are gone out into the world. I get accused a lot of time that I attack people. Now, if any of you know and you understand, and if you've watched any discussions that I've ever had in Facebook or wherever, you know that I don't attack people. It's the doctrine that we have to examine. And I think I can make a distinction between the person and the doctrine. So we have every scriptural right and, and warrant to examine any doctrine that's brought before us. That's what he says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Now, uh, others may, and I've seen this happen all the time, when people can't answer you, and, and you, uh, you've you got them pinned down with truth, the next thing that happens, they start making personal attacks. I don't answer in kind. You watch. I will not answer in kind. Because we're, we're to overcome evil with good. And we're not to render railing for railing. But we, we have every right to examine the doctrine that's being... Uh, put out. Remember what the Lord just said? He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Uh, 
And in another place, he told the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They thought they had, because they didn't bring any bread with them. But it wasn't, the, it wasn't about the natural bread. He was talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. And, we, and it, I guarantee you, it's out there in the world today, um, and it's getting worse and worse. And it's, uh, it's a doctrine that glorifies men and tries to uh, mingles darkness with light. You know, to realize that's one of the things that that, uh, that I'm going to say that God hates. One of the first things that God did, God said, there, said, let there be light. And God divided the light from the darkness. God made a distinction between light and darkness. They're to be separate. They're not to be mingled together. And that's one of the things that we see that churches are doing to compromise in order to gain people, to, in order to get money or whatever it is that their agenda is, that they're, they're bringing in some darkness, they're mingling some darkness with the light in order to placate the people and give them things that will attract them. And you've heard me say before, and I'll say again, I'll probably go to my grave saying it, that I believe that the love of God is sufficient to attract and hold the people in this place. And if that's not good enough for you, don't let the door hit you on the way out. I believe the love of God is sufficient. We don't need pizza parties or pianos or, or a three-ring circus. You know, you think I'm making that up. You just go out there and look, and that's what a lot of people are doing. It's a three-ring circus that's going on. We don't need that. We know that the Lord provided the church everything that she stood in need of before He ascended back into glory. And that's including the Holy Spirit, which was given on the day of the resurrection, not on the day of Pentecost. The power of the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. But the, the, the Holy Ghost was given on the day of the resurrection. John chapter 21, go check it out. Uh, but we're to try the spirits whether they be of God. Yesterday we were having, I uh, was sitting in a presbytery uh, at a, a deacon ordination in Denton. And they were examining, uh, at, questioning the candidates, and, and then they turned and asked the presbytery if they had any questions, and I asked the question What if uh, your preacher starts preaching heresy? What do you do? What do you do? And I would I would place the same thing before each and every one of you. Are you studied enough to know that if I get up here and I'm misspeaking or if I'm preaching heresy, are you uh, studied enough in the Word of God to know when I'm doing that? If you're not, you better be. And I know that some of you are. You need to watch over me or any man that comes into this pulpit. We need to try the spirits. Uh, but the thing, how, how would you, and the, the question that I followed up is, how would you handle that? Well, hopefully you'd come to me, take me aside, and you, you would admonish me in love, hoping to gain me and correct me. Um, but I, I, I have a sense that sometimes that uh, in some places preaching is taking place and nobody's questioning what's being said. Now, I'm a human. Uh, I don't have, I'm not 100% correct in my position. I, I'm, not, I'm not stupid enough to claim that. Now, but where am I wrong? Well, I don't know. If I knew, I'd pray for, for grace to repent of it. So that's why we need to keep an open mind, but not an unguarded mind. Keep an open mind, yeah, sure. We're called narrow-minded all the time, old Baptist are. Well, we can have an open mind, but just don't have an unguarded mind. We need to learn to try the spirits. He says, Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Where have you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world? Rarely do you hear people tell you that. 
The Antichrist is always future. And you know why he's always future? Because they want to scare you. They want to put fear into you to open your pocketbook and help and send them some money. That's why with them the Antichrist is always future. But here, right here, Paul says, even now is already in the world. Even back there when John was writing this, the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world. Now, whether there's going to be a manifestation at the end of time of, of one man as the beast or the Antichrist, uh, don't have time to go into all that. Um, but I, I believe that that uh, the devil has always had a desire to ascend to the throne of God and uh, and to be worshipped as God is worshipped. Uh, and I believe that the only way that he can do that is to be in the hearts of men. So, <clears throat> the temple of God. And our bodies are the temple of God. So that, that's why we need to be all the more careful about trying the spirits and what spirits that we let in. And uh, we need to learn to cast down you like this stuff, all this business on this uh, tree futon cart animated cartoon that's teaching sorcery. We, we need to learn to cast that stuff down. And we don't let, God forbid that we let, uh, let Walt Disney babysit our children. Now, if you've not done any, any investigating or checking into it, you need to because the occult is in all that stuff. And it started out very subtly, and now it's very strong. It's very strong. And, and like I said, when I saw that yesterday, I couldn't believe it. They're giving witchcraft lessons to these children right here, you know, right out in the open. The devil's not even trying to hide it. So we must be getting close. We must be getting close to, to the end of something. Whether it's this nation or whether it's the, the end of time, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But we need to try the spirits. And uh, don't, let the, don't let the TV babysit your children. <clears throat> I remember, you know who babysat me when I came up? It was mostly rock and roll. I can remember the song, the words to a rock and roll song that I heard 40-something years ago. And to my shame, I sometimes can't remember the songs to a hymn that I want to sing. But that stuff, that melody, that tune, that beat, it's all, it all has design. And if you don't think it does, you need to take a step back and ask the Lord about it. And that's the same thing, the music that we listen to, or the music that we let our children listen to, we need to be checking it out and making sure uh, th that it's kosher. Or, or that it's uh, not, not full of the same kind of um, uh, <laughs> same kind of evil. And I was thinking about rock and roll. <clears throat> and you know back 50 years ago, uh, when I guess about that time when Elvis came on the scene, there was a big uproar. It was a big thing. You couldn't when when Elvis Presley was on TV, you couldn't shoot him from below this part right here because he was shaking his hips, and that was a big deal. It was offensive to a lot of people, and you know what? They were right. And now you turn on the TV and you see all these naked men and women sitting there doing doing all kinds of dancing and stuff. And they call it dancing with the dancing with the stars, and it's it's okie dokie. It's all right. I, I just, Amen. I don't understand it. Well, I, I think I do, little by little, little by little. And that's the, if someone wanted to make changes in the church, that's the same way they would do it. They wouldn't they wouldn't bust through the doors and say, "We want to bring in a, a piano." Well, we think we'll put it over there. And I'll stand up and say, no, you're crazy. That's the same way if 50 years ago if someone would suggest we're going to put this show on the TV and it's called Tree Food Tom and he's going to teach all of our children how to be witches and warlocks, everybody would have stood up and said, no way. But little by little, little by little. And now, now we have what we have. But, yeah, I, I remember... Uh, the things that that used to shock us 
they don't shock us anymore. It's called desensitization. We've been desensitized. Right? We've become numb. You know, that's what it said about Jonah. When Jonah uh, ran from the, flee from the presence of the Lord and he was down in the, uh, the ship asleep, and that word asleep there means he was in a spiritual stupor. Or he was stupefied. You want to you want to run from the presence of the Lord? You're going to become stupefied. <laughs> you know, now you figure out what that means. It is, it's foolish to try to think that you can run from the Lord to begin with, right? But he was spiritually numb, and and, and he fell in a he was in a spiritual stupor because of the choice that he had made to run the opposite direction. God's people need to be running toward the Lord instead of away from Him. I wanted to get down to this in verse 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of Him and knoweth God. And they have to be a primitive Baptist. Oh, that was not in there. It doesn't say that. You want to know if someone's born of God? <clears throat> Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is, not will be, but is born of God. And knoweth God. I don't care where they're at. I don't care if they're on a desert island. I don't care if they're nomads. I don't care if they're Eskimos. It doesn't matter if they love. I'm talking about... You know, I hear people say all the time, well, I sure love Wendy's hamburgers. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about love. Greater love hath no man than this, and he's willing to lay down his life for his friends. And you hear stories about people trying to smuggle uh, Americans out of Iraq back in, in, during the Gulf War and how they hazarded their lives for these, for these Christian people to get them out. They were putting their lives on the line. That's love. And those people weren't Christians that were doing that. We cannot confine to say that only Christians have the love of God. I just cannot bring myself to do that. Because I don't believe that the Bible teaches that. I believe that it's much broader. That God has chosen the people out of every nation, kindred, and tongue. Of Revelation 5.9, I believe, is where that's at. God, God has His people everywhere. But He says, Whosoever loveth is born, born of God and knoweth God. So you can't teach somebody like that to know the Lord, can you? That's what he means when he says, They shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Why? Because according to John 6.45, they shall all be taught of God. We've all been taught of God. I didn't teach you how to love God. God taught you how to love God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. That's speaking to your worth. Your worth. He, he loved you to the degree that He was willing to send His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Now here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. When God loved us, we were His, first, we were His enemies. We were totally contrary to Him. Now that's true love. <laughs> that's love. Even when we're everything that we're about is totally contrary to what God would have us to do. Sort of like the Apostle Paul, you know, thought he was doing God's service by killing God's people. Everything he was doing was contrary to what God would have him do. Yet God loved him and God called him. And God struck him down on the road to Damascus. And he opened, and he uh, and the light shined from heaven. And after three days when those scales fell off his eyes, he was able to see. Uh, but anyway, he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means the satisfaction 
His offering satisfied God's wrath. It appeased God's wrath on our behalf, on the behalf of every one of God's elect. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That word ought, that's used in another place where he says we also ought to wash one another's feet. That's a strong word. You look that up. That's a command. That's not a su- Some people say, well, we ought to. That's, that's not a suggestion. That's a command. We're commanded of God to love one another. He says, by, by this shall all people know uh, that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. Now, well, this is where I wanted to get down to. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God had dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in Him, because He hath given us of His Spirit. Uh, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? They are the sons of God, according to Romans chapter 8. Here we know because God given of His Spirit. Uh, well, let me, let me get down to... I'm running out of time. Verse 16, And we know and we have believed that the love that God hath to us, God is love, and He dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God, and God in Him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. Now, I want you to pin that judgment down to this world because He says right there that's where it is, in this world. It's not talking about the great white throne judgment. There is no fear in love because love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So that's what I wanted to get to this morning to talk about that for just a minute. Fear hath torment. You see, that's what that's where the enemy wants you to be. He wants you to he wants to torment you. Now, I know there are other texts about it. The man that uh, that owed ten thousand talents, he begged the Lord to forgive him. The Lord forgave him, and then the same man went out and found somebody owed him a little money. He says, "Pay me what you owe me." And the man said, "Forgive me." And the Lord and the man didn't do it, and had him uh, so he had him cast in prison. And when, when the Lord heard about it, he, he was wroth, and he, that man was delivered to the tormentors. To the tormentors. <laughs> uh, the, so that he would pay. He would pay the othermost farthing. So, uh, but sometimes we may, because if we, if we, um, if we don't want to forgive, um, if we're not, when we're not forgiving, we're not walking in love, this perfect love, and then we may be delivered to the tormentors. But we, we need to walk in love, and we need to love one another as God for Christ's sake loved us, and He gave Himself for us. Uh, so, in other words, don't spend all our time holding grudges or looking for reasons to, to have a, a problem with someone, and if there, there's a chip on your shoulder, knock it off. And, and we don't have time for that. We need... We need to walk in the love of God each and every day that we live uh, on this earth. Uh, our, our time is short and we need to redeem the time. But uh, God forbid that, that uh, we're doing things um, that we're not being obedient to the Lord and we're delivered to the tormentors. I've been there, by the way. I had a situation... Uh, several years ago when there was a brother in the church that owed me $5,000 and I didn't want to forgive. And you know what happened to me? It ate me up. I was delivered to the tormentors to make it short. It ate me up until I finally decided that I would forgive it in my heart and forget about it and I moved on. But I know what it's like to be delivered to the tormentors. We don't, you don't want to, you don't want that. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, if you're delivered to the tormentors that you're going to hell. Uh, but, you know, sometimes there can be some hell on earth. Uh, have you ever heard that expression, hell on earth? Well, I believe there also can be a heaven on earth, and we can find that heaven on earth when we walk in the perfect love of God. 
and we're like I say, and we're not critical of everybody we see, and uh, and we we learn to love one another as as God for Christ's sake has loved us, and we're willing to give our lives and lay down our lives for one another. If he says, but there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. And he that feared is not made perfect in love, and we love him because he first loved us. That's true. We love God, and what is it, what is it that can separate us from the love of God? Look in Romans chapter eight in the latter part. It, there's nothing, and that's talking about the love that God has for us. That's not talking about the love that we have for Him, because sometimes we let things separate us from the love that we have for Him. Unforgiveness or... So what do you think... I, I seem to be... That seems to be one of the biggest things that I've noticed about um, Old Baptists and Betty and I talk about this a lot. <coughs> so the one, one of the things about Old Baptists is sometimes we just don't want to forgive. We don't have time. <laughs> we don't have time for that. We need, we need to forget it we need to love one another as God, uh, for Christ's sake, has loved us. And uh, we need to even learn to love our enemies. That's what He said. That's what the Lord said. Love your enemies. Do good to, do good them, to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your, of your Heavenly Father. In other words, that it's manifest. <clears throat> we're to love, to walk in love. You know, and I've told you this before, there, there are some mornings I, walk, uh, I wake up and, and I ask the Lord to help me to walk in love. Teach me how to do that. And it seems like I come across some of the ugliest people. It's put to the test. It's put to the test. And, and we, need, we need to learn to love and, and not judge. Like I, like I said, we don't know. Someone may be regenerate but just or elect, but just not regenerate. They may be living the life of the devil. We don't know. We don't know. Who, we can't look on the Lamb's Book of Life. Has anybody here looked on it? Anybody had that privilege to look on that book? No, not me neither. That's why we need to love. <clears throat> but... Uh, Love that's made perfect cast out fear. And that's what that's what I would hope that you would focus on in the weeks to come. Turn off the source of all that. You know, Sonny Piles, if you can't handle it, Sonny Piles has that saying that most people, when they build a house, they plumb the sewer to go out to the septic tank. Uh, but it's like with our TVs. It's just like we're plumbing the sewer right into our house, right into our living room. And uh, if you can't control it, and if it's controlling you, turn it off. If you don't have an understanding of what's coming out of it, turn it off. Um, so, but anyway, don't know what I'm going to talk about this morning. So, uh, I know I've been scattered, uh, but I would hope that you would uh, thank you for, for praying for me. And uh, I pray that uh, the Lord has given you something that you can take a hold of and that will be beneficial, that would comfort you, uh, that would give you direction and strength and, uh, until we come together in this capacity again. As we stand and sing a suitable hymn, and there's one or more ha have a desire to unite with this body, this would be your opportunity. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.